So this is a core teaching of the, the Buddha, isn't it? The Noble Eightfold Path. Everybody has heard, most Buddhists have heard of it. It's part of the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths, of course, are the truth of suffering or uh, unsatisfactoriness, the truth of the cause of that situation and the cessation of that cause and the path that leads to the cessation of suffering or uh, unsatisfactoriness. But that path includes, this is the path, this is a Noble Eightfold Path, and it includes the eight factors of uh, the Buddhist path. And these are all, all required for practicing the path. We can't just pick and choose. It's not a buffet. <laughs> so the first one is right view, samaditi. Second one is called, often called right thought, right intention. Ajahn Brahm is now calling it right motivation. That's good, I like that actually. And then we have uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood or right work, you could call it. Right effort, samawayama. And then we have, uh, we have the samasati, the samasati, satipatthana. This is the four focuses of mindfulness. And then we have samadhi as the eighth factor. And this is sometimes called concentration. But um, Ajahn Brahm and myself, I, I like it much better, but steadiness or stillness in the mind, that, uh, um, that peacefulness of mind, that focus of mind. So today we're going to, as I say, focus on the first, start on the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. I should be here long enough <laughs> that we finish the, the whole eight, eight factors. Otherwise I have to come back, <laughs> continue. And then who knows if we'll remember what I was talking about. But the whole point of talking about the Noble Eightfold Path is not so much to give you a textbook, you know, lecture or something about the, the Noble Eightfold Path of factors. It's try to make them very, as practical as possible so we can use them in our daily life, that we can see the purpose of them, that they can add to our practice. Because theoretical understanding is very, very useful, but it's the practice that really uh, brings the results. And it's only if we get results that we'll tend to practice, isn't it? Because if, if something, uh, you know, we practice something and we don't get any results, then we tend to think, well, I won't practice. <laughs> well, I'll try something else. So I'll start by, and the emphasis for uh, right view that I'd like to, to uh, uh, point out or make the emphasis is that right view is like a reality check. Um, and I... I uh, I think this is a very important and very practical uh, aspect of right view. That's a, a, a good way of checking up on reality. And if we are, in fact, uh, experiencing suffering in our lives, then it's a chance to check out what view are we running on that's causing this suffering. And, of course, uh, this comes back to the second noble truth, of course. We talked about the four noble truths. The cause of suffering or um, unsatisfactoriness, and that's always, always wanting wanting it to be something different, wanting to get something, wanting to get rid of something. So that will be the focus of the talk today. And I start with a verse from the, the Buddha. There's a number of uh, verses in the Dhammapada about the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, and this is verse 273, of all the paths, the Eightfold Path is the best. Of all the truths, the Four Noble Truths are the best. Of all the things that lead to fading away of attachments. This is the best. Of men, the seeing one, this is the Buddha, is the best. <laughs> so we're actually, any, any seeing one, the Buddhas are all seeing ones actually. So last time I mentioned that uh, the image for the Noble Eightfold Path, what was the image that I mentioned? It's quite a nice image. We, we don't have one here, uh, I don't think. It's the Dhamma wheel, isn't it? The wheel of Dhamma. And Dhamma chakra, yes. And it's a Dhamma, the Dhamma wheel that the Buddha started when he gave his first teaching. He said this was set in motion and it wasn't to be stopped by any, anyone. No one could stop the Dhamma wheel uh, rolling. Start. Um, so he set it in motion. But we don't have a Dhamma wheel here, but the Dhamma wheel has eight spokes. And of course... The, that is a representation of the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's very important to realize too that we need, we need all eight of those spokes. If you take out one spoke, 
then uh, you know, uh, then the, the wheel gets weaker, it doesn't work so well, it doesn't roll so well. And for our practice, we need all eight of them. Sometimes people like to do, all, do without the, uh, you know, the morality or ethical side, so right speech or uh, right action or right livelihood, and they think, well, don't need that. <laughs> I'm only interested in meditation, you know, like this is samawayama, which is right effort, uh, samasati, which is mindfulness, and samasamadhi, which is usually the jhanas or developing very unified states of mind. And so they want to discard the rest. But actual fact, you need all of them. It doesn't work without all the eight factors. And I remember one of the things that, uh, uh, and as, as we often, of people often comment, you can break those eight factors down into three, which is quite useful. It simplifies things. And those are, of course, we call the ethical behavior, sila, and that's right uh, speech, right action, right livelihood. And then we have uh, samadhi, or um, uh, uh, what we call stillness. This is where the mind is brought together, unified. And uh, this is sama samadhi. And we also have, uh, um, in that, in that uh, grouping, we have sati, of course, mindfulness. And we have a right effort, samawayama. And then the other grouping is wisdom. And this is usually sama uh, diti, which we're doing today, right view, and also a sama sankapa, which is also right thought or right motivation. And I remember when uh, when I first encountered the Noble Eightfold Path, and particularly the uh, the eight factors. And this was in Malaysia. Very interesting. In 1977, I I went on my first overseas trip. I was 20 something. <laughs> And I went to Malaysia, to Kuala Lumpur, and then to, I think it was in Penang that I saw this, actually, when I was in Penang. Went to a Buddhist temple, and I saw the Noble Eightfold Path. It's in English. It was in English. And it had the you know, right view and right... And immediately I'm, I thought when I saw this, what makes it right? Because, you know, you tend to you tend to think, well, you know, how can you tell somebody what's right and what isn't right? And, of, of course... What makes, uh, uh, say, view right, any of the factors right, is that uh, that's sama. Sama means uh, uh, right, it's interpreted as right, but it also means complete or full, and it has the sense of meaning that it's right for reaching the goal of awakening. That's why it's right. It's not, uh, uh, sometimes people, people can be put off where they say, oh, I'm right, you're wrong sort of idea. But it is right for reaching that goal, you know. Um, and so this, is, this is a, wasn't my understanding in 1977, but it was a good thing because when we have things like that, it brings up questions. I think, why is it right? <laughs> How can you say this is right and everything else is wrong? And uh, classically, in the suttas, you read that, that the, um, the people of different, different sects, different uh, religious uh, spiritual traditions would say that, we're right and you're wrong. <laughs> and so it's very classically the, the way it is. And as I mentioned, the beauty of the uh, last time I mentioned this to the beauty of the uh, Buddha's teachings, everything fits together. So here we have right view. And right view is part of the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths has the, uh, the path that leads to the end of suffering or end of uh, unsatisfactoriness, which includes right view. So they, they come together, they fit together. It's, to the, it's really uh, amazing the way the, uh, the Buddha uh, expressed the Four Noble Truths, the Dhamma in general. You know, it all fits together. And if it doesn't fit, then we can suspect that it may not be the teachings of the Buddha. <laughs> That's what he said. We can always check up. And this is a very good thing uh, with the Buddha's teaching. We can check up in the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, and in the rules for uh, monks, lay, uh, monks and nuns and lay people to see if it's consistent. So the first thing is, what is a view? You know, this is, this is something that uh, most people don't think of, actually, because it's so, we're so uh, ingrained in us. But a view is like a deeply held belief, uh, an opinion, attitude, sometimes assumptions uh, that color the way we look at ourselves and the world. And often we may not be aware of them. 
some of these views and uh, opinions and assumptions we've taken on board at an early age. I can see some of the ones that I've taken on that only later do you really examine and, uh, and you think, my goodness, this doesn't make sense at all. It's not useful. It's not leading to my happiness and well-being. And it's, uh, it's, it's actually making my life difficult. So sometimes we, we've taken on these views because other people have told us, you know, maybe our mother or father, or it's a very common view that everybody, many people have. And so we've taken on these views, and as a result, it affects the way we speak, we act, and we think. So these are very important uh, underpinnings of our mind, very, very important. And so in that case, that's what a view is, but then what is right view? And uh, the, the Buddha would say, this is a representation of reality. This is uh, the nature of reality um, and the meaning of life. It's also, at a very the basic level, the right view is like a road map for us. It's a road map of the path of wisdom we need to travel, the things we'll need to understand along the way. And it's very important that uh, we realize that this, uh, this understanding is not just belief. You know, it's no, good, it's no good if we just believe in karma, rebirth, the Buddha's enlightenment. That's good in a sense, that is good. But it's not our truth. It's not our, our understanding. So always all this aspect of right view is for us to understand. The Buddha understood it perfectly. That's his wisdom. It's not our wisdom. And so it's not a matter of believing. Belief is a good beginning, but we have to test it. We have to test those things and we have to understand them. And as I said, particularly the uh, other aspect of right view is that it's like a reality check for us. That we can, if we are experiencing difficulty in our life, if there are problems in our life, then we can check up. Uh, what's causing this? And we can find out uh, which view, there's usually a view behind it that's causing uh, some of the problems. And of course, as I say, there are two types of, of view. There's right view, and then of course, if you have right view, <laughs> you have to have wrong view. Right view is in accord with reality and doesn't lead to uh, uh, suffering, doesn't lead to unsatisfactoriness. But wrong view, uh, is any view that isn't coming from right view, that isn't coming from the way things are. And this is actually the first indication that we are at loggerheads with reality when uh, we experience suffering because it means that we are not accepting the way things are. Uh, maybe they're unpleasant, you know, maybe we've got an illness, maybe a family member's died, we've lost our job, and this is very difficult. This, but this is the way it is at the moment. And uh, what can we do? We can say that it's wrong, it shouldn't be like this, and then we can suffer a great deal. Or we can accept the fact that yeah, this is how it is at the moment, and we can move on from that, realizing that we can change things. It's not, it's not uh, um, predestined or anything like that. And often behind, <laughs> behind all these the suffering that uh, we experience or the unsatisfactoriness we experience, there are four, four actually uh, key things. And usually we're wanting things to be permanent, they're not permanent. So, for instance, when someone dies, you know, that can cause a lot of suffering. But, you know, we can ask ourselves, is there anybody that has never died, been born and never died? That's not possible. So we're asking the impossible when we want somebody who's died not to die. It's not possible. And that's usually one area. So permanency is uh, that wanting things to be permanent is a big, big part of it. And we're also seeking, often we're seeking for happiness. Uh, we're all seeking for happiness, actually. That's the major drive, drive for all of us. And often we seek it in, the, in things that cannot provide happiness, that are changing all the time. So we're looking for happiness in... In uh, usually in our experience, isn't it, of hearing, seeing, tasting, you know, food's a big one, seeing is a big one, and smelling, uh, touching, all these sorts of things. And we're looking for happiness there, and of course there is some happiness, but it's not lasting, it's not uh, satisfying. And we're also looking for, often we're looking for what is beautiful, <laughs> 
in things that aren't inherently beautiful. We, we actually make the beauty ourselves. And the biggest one, and this is where most of our suffering comes from, is that we are seeing a self in ourselves, in other people, that doesn't really exist. You know, it's an idea, a concept that we, we have brought up, we experience, and therefore we believe. And this is actually one of the, the biggest causes of suffering because when we have this self, we compare ourselves to others. We, we also uh, look at ourselves, criticize ourselves, and it causes the most of the suffering in the world. And this is a very, and this is where, a very nice quote from the Buddha, uh, where he said, "There is no single factor so responsible for suffering of living beings as wrong view, and no factor so potent in promoting the good of living beings as right view." So that that indicates that when we have a wrong view, yep, we're going to suffer, <laughs> but. You know, as practitioners, this is an opportunity to wake up. It's like a, a wake-up call, isn't it? To look at what we're experiencing and trying to understand it. Because this transforms our experience of suffering, of difficulty, unsatisfactoriness. If we can see meaning in it, we can understand it, then it changes it completely. Then we can let go of a lot of the suffering. Because we <laughs> realise... We're asking the impossible when we're asking that somebody doesn't die who has died and other things like that. So there's two levels of uh, right view and of course the first and most important one is of course an intellectual understanding of it. You know, It's very important that we have some idea of it. Of course the, the whole purpose of the path is actually to make it our own understood experience, not just theory not just something in the book, not just something the Buddha said, but to understand it. And uh, there's a, the basic uh, level of right view, of course, deals with karma, rebirth, and of course, the enlightenment, the spirit, uh, that there are spiritual teachers who have realized the truth, realized the nature of reality, and can teach it to others. And this, of course, includes the Buddha <laughs> and other Buddhas. So the the expression of right view that's very common in the teachings of the Buddha, this one is uh, uh, usually called, as I say, uh, it's often called mundane level, but I think it it's, it's goes beyond that too. And it's often expressed, and this is very nicely put by Bhikkhu Bodhi actually, that there is, um, it's the, this is the right view, giving, that there is giving and offering of arms which has uh, ethical significance, that there is good and bad deeds which produce like results, that one has a duty to look after one's mother and father, that there is rebirth and a world beyond this one, and that there are religious or spiritual teachers who have found, uh, who have found, uh, can be found, who expound the truth about the world from their own realization. So that, that's the first level of right view, and that's most important, that's like a foundation actually. And I'll go into that in a little more detail later. Uh, just to mention that giving, you know, I can go into it a bit now, giving and offering alms has ethical significance. Sometimes people don't realize the importance of giving and uh, that what a power it is. Actually, the Buddha, uh, another way of expressing his teachings was dana, sila, bhavana, and dana, giving sila, ethical behavior, and bhavana, mental cultivation, mental development. And so he, he put a lot of emphasis on giving because it has an effect on the mind. For instance, it brings happiness to the mind. And it means when we give, usually our minds are quite a, um, a less, a less defiled, there's less negative aspects in the mind. So giving actually has a very beneficial effect and it can be used to uh, you know, enhance all aspects of our lives. Because if we remember we've given a gift and we can remember the happiness <laughs> maybe of the person who received it, the happiness we had actually, uh, then that can be used whenever we feel a bit low, you know, we feel a bit depressed, we can be, ah, oh, yes, did that good thing, I did uh, give, give. And also, of course, uh, um, you know, giving uh, creates uh, a bond with other people, creates harmony. And it's a very important factor on the path, uh, which, as Bhikkhu Bodhi says, has ethical significance. So it creates 
good karma. It creates those good um, qualities in the mind. And what's more important too is that when we have good qualities, there's not much chance for the negative to arise. So it's, it's a very good way of actually overcoming negative ones by doing good. And also karma, this is, a, is very is key, isn't it? That there is um, result from the things we do, say and think. Um, I, know, I know people even in Sri Lanka who tell me they don't believe in karma. Like, I find it amazing because I think if, you look, if we look at our lives here and now, we can see sometimes we see what we call instant karma. We do something good and get an incredibly good result immediately. Sometimes we do things or say things uh, negative and we get results almost immediately. And you can see that operating in life. Of course, you can say sometimes you do good and you don't see the results here and now. But this is, I'm talking about instant karma, you know. You can see that there is a relationship, a causal relationship between what we do and what we think and what we say and the results that come from that. And especially, you know, if people don't believe in karma in that sense, you can look at the mind. This is always a very good place to see it. If we think lots of negative thoughts, if we criticise ourselves a lot, if we uh, put ourselves down a lot, if we compare ourselves negatively to other people, what ends up happening? We have these thoughts, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm hopeless, I'm hopeless. Surprise, we become depressed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really obvious, isn't it? The way we use our mind gives rise to a, 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 an effect, a result. So this is a, just the basics of karma. So I always find it very difficult, find it strange now that uh, you know, people find it, uh, they think karma was something that was added to the Buddha's teaching you know, or that he was just a, going along with because it was a current uh, idea. And this is not, not at all the case. So, and that one has a duty to look after one's mother and father. And this is uh, very important these days. Because, of course, that relationship is a karmic relationship, one that is not accidental and is a very strong, important relationship because our parents are the biggest conditioning factor for when we're young. And they look after us, they bring us up, they provide the, uh, not only the, the physical uh, conditions we need to survive, because a baby is absolutely helpless, isn't it? Absolutely helpless but they also provide the emotional support and love. And this is actually the most important ingredient for, uh, for children, for happy and having a happy, well-balanced life. And um, so that's the... And that there is rebirth in a world beyond uh, this. That's an important thing too, because then when our practice, if it were only for this life, Sometimes one might think, well, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point, you know? It'll all finish once I, I die. But, of course, one could also argue that in this life people experience, uh, you know, uh, uh, unsatisfactoriness and suffering in this life, difficulties in this life. So, therefore, they would practice, perhaps, just to deal with that, even though they know they were going to die and that would be the finish. But, generally speaking, the Buddha said that if we have the view that this is only one life and this is it, then we'll, we will think it's pointless to really practice a spiritual path because in the end, no different. <laughs> we, just be, we all end up in the same place. And uh, so that's uh, an important, uh, as it were, view. And that there are spiritual teachers who have realized the truth, who realized what reality is about, the meaning of life, and have taught it. And of course, the Buddha is one of these teachers, and it's important that we have that uh, that uh, that understanding, because then we can uh, listen to their teachings. Then we can have some respect for those teachers and can use those teachings. And of course, the Buddha said, you know, we shouldn't blindly believe teachers just because they say, and nearly every tradition says it. I've seen the truth. I know reality. They all say it, don't they? But the Buddha said, you know, when we have lots of these different views of what truth is, what reality is, just to practice, we practice those teachings and it leads to wholesome states, positive states, beneficial states, then we can know this is in accord with reality, within, in accord with truth. But if it leads to more suffering, more unhappiness, is not beneficial, then we can assume this is not, you know, in accordance with reality. It's not useful for us. 
And this is, of course, from the Kalama Sutra that he taught this. So that level of right view is a, is a very important basis for our um, practice as Buddhists. Do we have to believe in it to be a Buddhist? Do we have to believe in those things to be a Buddhist? Karma, rebirth, um, the enlightenment, that there are spiritual, spiritually enlightened teachers. Do we have to believe that to be a Buddhist? You have to? Yep. Or is it delicate no, we don't have to. We don't have to believe it. What's, what's the basic requirement for becoming a Buddhist? No, not even practice, actually. <laughs> Taking the three refuges. That's it. That's all. If you take three refuges, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the... You're a Buddhist. You're a Buddhist. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> But if you want to be a practicing Buddhist, you have to take it a little further. <laughs> and usually at least minimum, isn't it, is the five precepts that we took. So, and, uh, but there are many Buddhists in this world who are not practicing, but they're still Buddhists. So it's, it's, uh, it points to the fact that the Buddha wasn't requiring us to believe these things in order to qualify, in order to become Buddhists. In other religions, if you don't believe in the teacher, if you don't believe in Jesus, for instance, can you be a Christian? It's very, pretty difficult. Or in, uh, if you don't believe in God in Judaism, can you be a Jew? I think that would be pretty radical. And the same with Islam. If you didn't believe in uh, Allah and Muhammad as his, pro as his prophet, then you would not be considered to be a follower of that faith. The very different quality of Buddhism is that it's not... Uh, very faith bound it isn't based on faith like those teachings are they're the great faiths that's what they're called the great faiths but Buddhism is much more open it's much more inquiring the Buddha knew these things with the karma or rebirth and so on he knew them from his own experience from his enlightenment experience in fact so he is not requiring us to believe them what he is requiring us to do is to investigate them understand them because the, uh, what makes a person fully enlightened is understand, full understanding of suffering, understanding, full understanding of unsatisfactory, uh, unsatisfactoriness, the nature of existence. That is, is what makes a person uh, start on the path to become enlightened. So it's full understanding, full inquiry is much more important than uh, just believing. Of course, you can say, to be, if you say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, that does indicate you have some faith that this is meaningful in your life, it's worthwhile, it will lead to beneficial things. And actually, in actual fact, we all need, as it were, faith or confidence that something is worthwhile before we'll even try it. And we have faith in many things, actually. People don't realise they have so much faith in science, <laughs> in technology. There are lots of things we have faith in, actually. So, but the second uh, level uh, of, as it were, um, intellectual understanding is the Four Noble Truths. And I mentioned those before, that this is suffering, its cause, and the, um, the cessation of suffering or unsatisfactoriness, and the path that leads to that ending or that cessation of unsatisfactoriness. Just to know that is, is uh, important. If you never knew that, how could, if you never heard of it, how could you practice, practice it? How could it occur to you if you had never heard it before? And so the, in the time of the Buddha, the most important thing was to, and we don't do this very much now, is to hear the Dhamma, to memorize it, and then they used to recite it, recite it over and over again, and then to investigate it, um, investigate what they had recited, and then to penetrate it, they say, with view. So to go deeply into it, to really understand it. And when that happens, then it becomes that person's direct experience. It's not second-hand uh, knowledge. It's their own experience then that they have arrived at from inside. And this... Uh, this, this is the level of intellectual understanding, but of course the most important thing with that is to make that experiential, and that's what I was pointing to. 
and this is particularly the case with the Four Noble Truths, they are aimed at uh, leading to the breakthrough, to enlightenment, to Sotapanna. This is a stream enter, the first stage of enlightenment, uh, which can happen when we see the Four Noble Truths, particularly when we see uh, through uh, Sakaya Ditti, the view of a self. This is the most important breakthrough for all of us because that's such a, such a strong view that we have in our minds that uh, it's, it's the shattering of that view that allows for uh, enlightenment to happen. And one and then attains, to, could say, attains to view. So in other words, that first stage of enlightenment, they say view is perfect, so that one has seen, one's understood uh, uh, the view of a self as being totally um, incorrect. And in fact, that is great liberation, great happiness <laughs> to, to be free of that. And it leads to... Uh, it leads to uh, enlightenment to awakening. But I think one of the things that when we talk about uh, right view and we uh, and views in general is to examine what views we are running on, you know. And, and it's important sometimes just to give some thoughts to those views. And I mentioned some of them already actually. A very common uh, belief when I was young and I think it's still probably um, quite, quite common is that there's only one life, this life. And once that finishes, that's the end of the story. But I think now people are more open to the idea that uh, there are other lives, that there is rebirth. But when I was younger, that was this materialist view that, uh, that um, the mind, the experience of uh, life, the mind dies with the body. And uh, the materialist view holds that the mind is just a product of uh, the material body, the brain, and so on. And then when it dies, um, it takes, life is finished, it's over with. If you take that point of view, as I say, <laughs> then in many ways, it doesn't matter what you do, <laughs> ethically speaking, you know, if you take that view, and you see it very much in, in our present world, don't you? It leads to trying to live life to the full, as they say, which means seeing as much as possible, hearing as much as possible, tasting as much as, much as possible, smelling and feeling with the body. So, so we have, you know, people wanting to see movies, travel, see videos, um, see art exhibitions. They're wanting to hear all the great music, whatever that is for, the, for each person. And the food, taste all the different types of foods. So in this view, experience is the big, is the most important thing. But anybody that has had, even to some degree, a capacity to do that, what do they realize? Yeah, it's not it. It's not it. It's unsatisfactory too. The more you get of it, the more bored you get with it, and the less impressed. If you had to watch, if you love videos, if you had to watch them for, say, a whole day without a stop, wow, what a torture. And it reminds me, it reminds me of a Gary Larson cartoon I saw. And this man had just arrived in hell and the devil's there and there's a TV set and everything. He said, oh, wow, you've got TV. And the devil says to him, there's only TV here. <laughs> so there's no escape from TV. It's the same with all our senses. You know, if we had to, if we had to eat our favourite food for any length of time, I said this many times, if, even half an hour, it would, it would be oh, unpleasant and be probably border on painful. And after, after an, if we had to keep going for an hour, we'd never want to eat that again. <laughs> so it's the same with all these, all these uh, pleasures of the senses. They're like that. They're of that nature. Have to be. And this is uh, something that's important to see, that experience in and of itself is not, is not what brings happiness. And this is a very important teaching of the Buddha, isn't it? That the, the sense happiness, happiness as we can get from the senses, there is happiness for sure. But it's not the sort of happiness that actually satisfies, fulfills us, that uh, makes us re truly happy. And that comes, of course, not from out there. That's the five senses, isn't it? What we see, hear, smell, taste and touch is out there. It's what's in here. And, of course, this is a far more lasting happiness. This is a happiness that feeds our, our minds and our hearts when we develop contentment, when we develop um, uh, loving kindness, compassion, uh, when we develop joy, 
joy with others, others' success and good qualities, and when we have equanimity in the mind, and when we, there are lots of contentment, as I mentioned. There's lots of uh, happiness. As giving is a very good happiness too that I mentioned before. Very important. So it's very important just to see, do I believe that there's only one life and, and go through the consequences of believing uh, uh, what happens if we do believe that. But as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, one of the strongest uh, sufferings for all of us is this sense of that there is a permanent self, that there's something that endures, that goes on, that's common to all our experience. And it often feels like that. It, it, it feels like... Uh, that there is something that's abiding and that this is something that uh, we're attached to in a, in a very real sense and it's what drives us through life so it's that sense too I see it in meditation when people come for meditation we often we this is <laughs> Ajahn Brahm's always talking about it too is that we're going to make it happen. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get uh, uh, jhana. Or I'm going to get deep meditation. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. this sense of self that's going to make things happen. And it's very, very common in, in our lives. You know, in success in business, everybody thinks you have to have this strong sense of self uh, in order to succeed. In actual fact, particularly in meditation. I don't know so much about business, but I think it's the same, really. It's true of life. What we need is the right causes and conditions <laughs> for deep meditation to happen, for success to happen. And these are, these are the things that are actually bringing the result, not the sense of I, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. That is actually usually causes a lot of problems and frustrations because if we don't have the causes and conditions, it doesn't matter how much we wish things to be this way and not that way. It won't happen. But if we have the causes and conditions right, we can, it will happen. And one of the biggest uh, sufferings for all of us is uh, this sense of self is that uh, it owns this body and this mind. And we think that, uh, that we're the owners of, of this body and mind. And that is a great suffering for us as well. Because what happens when the body gets sick, gets old, and then dies? If this is mine, how dare it? <laughs> how dare it do this? And the same with our minds. You know, people say it to me all the time. They come to meditation. They say, I sit down, but I can't control my mind. It just goes thinking, thinking, thinking. And I say, good, that's number one insight. <laughs> number one insight. Very good. You've got it in one. You know that you can't control this mind as much as you try. You, you, you will not be able to make it this way, not that way. And this is actually the second teaching of the Buddha he gave in the Anatalakana Sutta, that the body, we can wish it to be this way, look that way, uh, not look this way, not look that way, but it won't make any difference. And you can do as much plastic surgery as you like, <laughs> it'll still get old and it'll still die. <laughs> it's beyond, beyond our control. And uh, sometimes in the process, people look far worse than they did before, or look very odd, <laughs> very strange. But they think they look okay. <laughs> so that's the main. But uh, so, and also the same thing with the mind. But the Buddha broke it down into: we think our feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, they're ours, but they're not. They're a phenomena that arises due to causes and conditions. We think our our perception, you know, our memories of the past how we see things, the things we like, dislike, and so on, that they are ours, but they are rising due to, due to conditioning. We think our will, the idea that I decide to do this, I decide not to do this, I decided to come here today, and so on, is our, we're doing it. But in actual fact, it's conditioned by what we did in the past. So you may have come here before, for instance, and thought, Oh, it was okay, it was worthwhile, I enjoyed it, I, I liked the lunch, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> people people say, so I'll come again, it's good. So it's conditioned by our previous experience. And if you're here for the first time, it's probably somebody else said, oh, you must come. Or, and you might have thought, well, I'd prefer to do something else, but I don't want to offend them, so I'll, I'll go along, at least this once. So all these things are conditioned. They're not necessarily coming from a sense of self, uh, from which is a the usual thing. We always think will is self, but actually it's a very conditioned phenomena too. It feels like we're running the show, but it's not actually the case. And 
And so the other aspect is consciousness, you know, that the, uh, particularly the mind consciousness, which can perceive all the things we see here, smell, taste and touch. Um, we can't control that either. And the fact that we can't control it does suggest that we're not the owners of it as well. We can't own it. Because something you own, you should be able to control to some degree. And we can, this body and mind, we can control to some degree, but not, not so much. And the more we try to control it, the more difficulty we have. And of course, the other, the big area with uh, self is I am like this, where we, we define ourselves. And this is where there's a lot of suffering for us because we define ourselves by all the things uh, that we are attached to. I'm, I am a man, I am a woman, I'm a good person, I'm terrible, I'm hopeless, I'm wonderful. I'm <laughs> many, many things that we see ourselves. And this is where we create most of our suffering, actually. And this is where, um, uh, which is also conditioned and this comparing is one of the, the biggest things that causes suffering in our lives. We look at every, everybody else in situations and we think we're either better than that or them or we're the same or we're not as good. And when we do this comparing, we're building up this sense of a self. You know, we, we're trying to make something solid, which is really just an idea, a concept that's causing a lot of our problems. So these are some of the areas where we, uh, some of the views that uh, we, we take on board and uh, that we may or may not be aware of. That's, that's the very interesting thing. The more that we're aware of them, the less power they have. Uh, one, one more that I'll mention, a couple actually, is sometimes we have this perfectionism in mind. We want things to be perfect. Uh, we, <laughs> we want ourselves to be perfect, we want others to be perfect and, we, and uh, of course anybody that uh, has tried to make things perfect, if, even if you've tried to make your house perfect, your garden perfect, does reality help you out? Does it comply? Does it? No, it usually, it usually is always far from perfect, you know. And the more perfect we try to make things, actually perfection, what is perfection? It's like trying to control, isn't it? It's trying to control others, control ourselves, and control our environments to make them the way we want them and not to be the way we think they shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like this. We want them perfect. And of course, this is, this is being at loggerheads with reality in a big, big way. And because we'll realize very soon that others are not out there to make us happy, to comply with how we think they should be. They're out there to look after themselves. And so this whole um, search for perfectionism is really uh, just a, a, a way of not accepting reality as it is and therefore like um, creating the cause for suffering, the cause for unsatisfactoriness which is wanting things to be in a particular way or wanting them not to be in a particular way. So that is a, perfectionism is, a, is quite a good one for all of us because who doesn't want things to be the way they like? That's natural, isn't it? It is quite natural to try and get things the way you like. But if we have that sort of understanding, well, can't control everything. <laughs> things will often turn out different from what I expect. You know, for instance, for me, even simple things like I like it when I'm at my hut, my kuti, in the forest in Sri Lanka, and I've been sweeping the, uh, the area around the kuti. I have a very nice kuti, very beautiful kuti, and it's got sand. It's got sand uh, all around it, this nice uh, light-coloured sand, and you sweep it. And in Sri Lanka, they do nice patterns and everything. It's quite nice. It can look, look very beautiful, actually. But I always, I'm sweeping away and then I turn around and I see the leaves falling and I think, ah, good, <laughs> good, <laughs> some, some uh, imperfection. And, uh, and there was a Japanese story like that too, a uh, Zen story like that. This person who, because in Zen you have rake gardens, you know, these little pebbles that you rake into various patterns and everything. And uh, this, uh, this teacher had all these students and you tell them to clean the, uh, you know, to sweep to rake the garden and they'd get rid of all the leaves and it would look perfect. And when they weren't looking, he would come and scatter a few leaves around <laughs> just to give them a teaching that life is imperfect 
And in actual fact, that imperfection is, is perfect in a sense. How else could it be? How else could it be? And that's what I, uh, one of the teachings that one uh, teacher, American teacher gives, uh, and she says that whatever you experience is perfect. And I thought, oh God, that can't be true. <laughs> You know, if experiencing bad health, terrible, uh, terrible family situation, you've just lost your job. How can that be perfect? But it's perfect in the sense if that's what's happening now. It couldn't be any other way at this moment. But it doesn't mean that it has to be the same next moment or the moment after. We can change that. But that is a really, when somebody says that to you, oh, it's perfect, and you just had, had the most terrible day of your life, you think, what? What are they talking about? Absolute nonsense. But it does point to that, that fact that, uh, you know, we cannot make things perfect. And, and actually that acceptance of it brings peace. And then we have the third noble truth that I was talking about, the cessation of unsatisfactoriness, of un and suffering, is actually accepting, yep, yeah, this is the way it is. How else could it be for this moment? It, doesn't, uh, it does not take away our, our, our power to change. Because after this we can change, we can point things in a different direction. And maybe it will work out, maybe it won't. It will be sometimes unreliable. And of course, uh, the other thing that, uh, the last one I was going to mention, that's quite nice in a way in a, in a context of uh, Buddhism, is uh, rites and rituals. You know, people often have views about rites and rituals. You see it in Sri Lanka quite a bit, you know, that people will... Um, do particular particular rites and rituals, make offerings to the devas, to their gods, and then expect to get you know good results in the exams or get over their illness, and so on. And sometimes this does happen. Actually, it does happen that this is this is the case. But but it's it's in the Buddha's teaching, everything runs on cause and effect. <laughs> so, so maybe they've done a good thing and they get a good effect. You could say that. You could say that. But in actual fact, offerings to the gods and even to the Buddha won't necessarily give the results you expect. But if one does it with a good heart, good mind, with a lot of joy and a lot of happiness, it will give rise to a very a good result, whatever that be. Especially in the mind, it can give rise to a very good result. So this is another important thing that you see in Sri Lanka, it's very big. You know, that go to the Devalias, the, uh, these are the shrines to the gods, make offerings and then ask for various things. And then um, if, if they're fulfilled, then you, you give even more, you know, as, as uh, part of the deal, isn't it? Part of the deal. So it's, uh, it's interesting. I, always, I remember one teaching, I saw a very nice, uh, nice teaching from a, I think he's a Hare Krishna, he's quite famous, he's on the internet. He's called uh, uh, Gopal Dias. Have you ever heard of him? Gopal Dias. I think you might have heard of him. And he, he says, people come, and he's talking about in the Hindu context, people come to the temple and they're always asking for God, I want this, I want that, and you, please give me this, please give me that. And he says, they never come thinking, what can I give God? What can I give? And this is, this is actually the powerful way. What can I give is actually powerful, not what I want to get. <laughs> And this is what the power of uh, giving, dana, generosity is, is that, that, that goodness that wants to give and such a wholesome state of mind. So I think we're almost um, at the end of uh, the talk, but very important to mention that the, for the experiential um, right view to take effect, and that means to lead to enlightenment, we have to develop the other path factors, the other factors of the path. The Noble Eightfold Path only works if it's got the eight spokes and will, only, and will lead to enlightenment if it has those eight elements. And a very important uh, thing about right view, it makes it actually the single most important factor is that every other factor of the path, if it does not have right view, is wrong view. So even if you, if you, uh, if you don't have right view as the beginning, then you won't have uh, right motivation, then you won't have right speech, then you won't have right action, and you won't have uh, right livelihood, right uh, effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. You may have, it may be, you know, you may enjoy it, and it may have some benefic beneficial effects, even though it's wrong, 
but it will not lead to enlightenment. That's the basic point. That's the, the whole package, the whole package. So these days people try to unpack it, <laughs> and we have lots of uh, secular mindfulness, for instance, is taking one aspect of the Buddha's teaching, uh, Buddha's understanding, and then making that into a whole path. And that will have benefit. I think it has benefit for sure. But it won't lead to enlightenment per se. But I always feel, you know, when I hear um, people say, and Ajahn Brahm too, that it's, 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 not, it's not the correct way to approach mindfulness. I still think you know, that people will get benefit from it and maybe from that experience of benefit, I think, well, where did this come from? <laughs> and then they look into the other teachings and then they realise, oh, yes, the way I uh, behave, what I say, what I do is important and also, um, you know, to develop wisdom as well is important understanding. But in order to, the main conditions for um, experiencing uh, the attainment of enlightenment, as I mentioned, all the other eight factors, but to have sila, to have this ethical behaviour is very important, and also to develop the, the mind, so with this is particularly samadhi, to develop stillness in the mind, peace in the mind, and then the wisdom will come, the wisdom that leads to enlightenment, leads to breakthrough. So this is, um, this is how uh, we can practice the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, and particularly Sama uh, Ditti, Right View. And, and in that way, we can lead to benefit in this life, we can lead to happiness here and now, and it can lead to enlightenment too. It's important to remember that the Buddha's path is aimed at three things, happiness here and now, happiness in future lives, if you believe in future lives, and the happiness of Nibbāna, of enlightenment, of awakening. So those three things, and they're all part of the teaching, so very important parts. So I encourage you to use Right View to enhance your practice, to see what you're believing in and what you're running your world on, and to question, <laughs> question those views, not just to accept them, to ask, are they true? Are they absolutely true? How do I feel when I have this view, particular view? And you can tell if it's positive or negative. If you feel terrible, you know it's not so useful. And how would I be if I never had this view? And then just see the difference, see the power of view, of thought. So I'd like to finish there and uh, wish you well for this uh, first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. <laughs> So sad, 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 sad.